Welcome. I'm delighted to have this opportunity to welcome you uh, to this panel discussion and to introduce this uh, session. Uh, but first, I'd like to offer my warmest thanks to the panelists for contributing both their time and their expertise to us today. Now, the VC's Innovation Awards 2020 celebrate research-led innovations across the entire university. We're especially interested in an innovation that has a societal and economic impact. Uh, now, this panel is the culmination of the Innovation Conversation webinar series, which has been given by each of the category winners. So if you haven't yet had the chance to watch them, I would strongly encourage you to go back and, and watch the rest of the series. Now, we at Oxford are very proud of our rankings, especially this year. The Times Higher Ed ranked us number one in the world for the fifth year in a row. Uh, due to our research, the caliber of our research and the extent of our international research collaborations. Uh, the Guardian named us number one because of our attention to teaching and the quality of the teaching and the experience of our, our students here. The Sunday Times ranked us um, University of the Year for two reasons, they said, because of our work on a COVID vaccine and because of our progress in uh, enhancing the diversity of our undergraduate student population. All these rankings, of course, are fairly British, have a British bias, but even other rankings like the QS ranking ranked us fourth in the world, and they have a British bias, they have an American bias rather, uh, the top three uh, universities ranked our American, so we were the top one outside of the US. Um, all of these rankings reflect the fact that we are an innovative institution that prides itself on its capacity uh, to innovate. Um, now on the face of it, the ancient buildings and the dreaming spires and majestic architecture don't quite seem to resonate with innovation. But don't be deceived. It's what goes on inside these buildings that really matters. In fact, it's precisely our ability to innovate that has enabled us to thrive as a university for all these years. The men, and, and they were by and large for too long a time, entirely men, but the men who led this great university for centuries uh, didn't do so by looking backwards, but rather by looking to the future and imagining ways of translating the work conducted within the university for the betterment of the society beyond the university. Our mission has not changed in 900 years. It has been to conduct, re conduct research, to educate the next generation, and to improve the world around us. Thanks to the work of our medics in battling COVID-19, the world is getting a sense of just how creative and innovative we are. But the innovation ecosystem and the entrepreneurial culture of this institution pervades all four of our divisions, humanities, social sciences, medicine, and mathematical, physical, and life sciences. The big challenges facing the world today, clearly the pandemic, but also climate change, inequality, the economic recovery, these all have to be addressed. And our best hope of effective solutions to these problems will be when innovative universities collaborate with business, with other universities around the world, with policymakers to forge shared solutions to shared problems. And our panel today represent expertise in all of these areas. So I'm going to turn it over to them now. Again, thank them for joining us. I should say, that we very much regret that we are not all meeting in person in the magnificent Sultan Nazarin Shah Center at Worcester College, but you will have a, a virtual rending of that uh, fabulous space behind the panelists. So over to the panelists and thank you for joining us.
Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, we're here to think about how universities can drive innovation. Now, I'm going to say a few words, but uh, mainly I want to set the time aside for our panelists. We've got four brilliant individuals uh, representing the different stakeholders. We've got Sam, we've got uh, Wendy Becker, we've got Tony from UKRI, and we've got Trevor from Kiel. Now, these individuals are here to discuss how we can work together to accelerate innovation, to come up with solutions to some of the biggest challenges facing our planet. Now, like all of you, we all worry about climate change. We worry about food production, clean water, energy. We worry about um, mental health. We worry about uh, future pandemics. We worry about a growing number of people becoming resistant to existing antibiotics, aging societies, etc. So we have massive, massive challenges. Now, what we want to do is to think about how industry and universities and governments and funders and regulators can work together to create solutions to some of those problems. It's been really heartwarming for me in Oxford in the past several months, six, seven, eight months, to see how things have come together specifically around creating this vaccine. So a couple of years ago, a couple of our academics, Adrian Hill, Sarah Gilbert, created a small spin-out, Vaxitech. At the start of this year, the senior leaders in the university, our vice chancellor, who you heard from earlier on, our Regis professor, John Bell, and the head of the medical school, Gavin Screeton, a brilliant clinician named Andrew Pollard got together. They involved government, they involved regulators, they involved funders, Obviously, OSI, who are the, one of the funders of Vaxitech, this company that was created by Adrian and Sarah, they pulled in AstraZeneca, and together they focused on how do we generate a vaccine as quickly as possible for the whole planet. And what's happened in the past six, seven, eight months probably normally would have taken close to six, seven, eight years, etc. So it's amazing what we can do when we all pull together with that single purpose. I think it's fair to say that in the UK, we are in a very fortunate position. We have brilliant universities across the land. They are producing great researchers, great leaders, great innovators, great entrepreneurs. And we also have a brilliant alumni network dispersed right across the world. We're also fortunate in this country that we've got some amazing infrastructures and resources. So I think of things like uh, the catapults that were funded by the government, uh, UK Biobank, Genomics England Project, the Crick Institute, and then of course probably in healthcare, the biggest infrastructure resource asset we've got in the UK is our NHS. Access to what, 67 million patients, data on all those patients, lots of clinicians, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think it's also fair to say that in the UK, we enjoy more investment per head in terms of creating new companies, so venture capital type funding, more investment per head than any other country in Europe. Now, it's not as much as the US and it's not as much as China, but we're still better than any other country in Europe. And this current government is committed to increasing expenditure on research and innovation to 2.4% of our GDP. So I think that's an exciting prospect. So let me not spend any more time giving an intro. I'm going to hand over, first of all, to Sam to give us some of the things that he worries about or things that he thinks that we can do better in the UK to really drive this innovation agenda. So Sam, over to yourself. Thank you. Charles, uh, thank you very much for um, that introduction. I agree with um, everything you said. Um, I think universities should be at the heart of an innovation economy. And certainly for the UK, if the UK is going to move up the economic leap table, our universities have a critical role to play. 
um, not just as places where ideas come to life, where they become ventures, where they grow and prosper, but also where they make a transformational impact in addressing some of the big challenges that we face as an economy, but also as, an, as a society. I think the first thing I would say is that we've come a long way. Uh, we've come a long way. You know, 30 years ago, we weren't talking about dot coms, we weren't talking about CRISPR, the Human Genome Project I just started. Um, we weren't even talking about graphene then. So we've come a long way in terms of certainly the scientific base and knowledge um, within the UK. And also, if you look at the number of spin out companies coming out of Oxford now versus 30 years ago, we've made a huge uh, leap forward in that sense. But I think there is still significant room for improvement. I agree with what you said about the assets that we have as a country, whether it's the CRIP, whether it's the catapult centers. I mean, within Oxford, you've got the business school, you've got the foundry, you've got Oxford Science and Innovation, you've got the medical school, but you've also got venture capital and a venture capital ecosystem in the UK that is the strongest in Europe. So my sort of first point really is how you connect all these nodes to actually create unicorns. Um, so although we've got, so we have the UK has 13 of the 34 or so unicorns in Europe, that, and Oxford has been, if you take Oxford example, Nanopore, it's a great company, PowderJet, a great company. We're still yet to find a way to consistently churn out those kind of companies that are worth a billion or more in the way that what I would say our peer group, you know, your Stanford's of this world are able to do. So when it comes to research output, we are sort of the best in the world, but when it comes to actually translating, creating companies out of it, we still have a way to go. And I think there are a number of things we can do to build on the strong foundations that we have. You mentioned the government's commitment to um, R&D and increase in R&D. I think that is very welcome. Of course, strong focus public investment in R&D is an es essential precondition to having a university system that is really driving the um, economy. But alongside that, what we need is long-term patient capital. The life cycle of a lot of the companies sit looking at it from my perch at Oxford University Innovation, the life cycle of a lot of the spin outs is seven, 10, in some cases, 15 years. And so you need a capital environment that allows investors to invest for that long. And how do you do that? I think British patient capital and British, the British Business Bank have got to take a, spe a special and a strategic look at how you can support basically deep tech and deep science spin outs coming out of our universities that are going to be the unicorns of the future. And so if they're investing in tech funds that are really focused on software that you can churn out very quickly, you will be losing out on some of the investment that you need for deep tech transformation, which is what a lot of what we see in our universities. So I think that is the need for long-term patient capital is essential. Um, the British Patient Capital Fund and British Business Bank are, and UKRI play a role here, but also unlocking pools of capital to be able to do so. The local government pension scheme is 300 billion. Uh, just moving the dial in terms of how they allocate capital to some funds that are addressing big challenges, <clears throat> like the ones we see at our universities, I think could make a transformational difference in the funding that goes into these companies and therefore their ability to become unicorns and drive jobs and growth. And we know that um, something like 6% of the fast growing companies in the country create most of the jobs. The second point I'm going to make um, beyond the uh, need for capital is obviously to do with people. And, and it is people that come up with ideas. It is people that run companies. It is people working together that, in, uh, that sparks of ingenuity and creativity that we need. And, that me and people means firstly in terms of immigration, 
they're being very open. Um, and I think um, to the brightest, the best, the talented and the entrepreneurial, you know, and I think sometimes policy talks about when, when this is discussed in policy, we talk about sort of the very established scientists, but actually nobody really knows the researchers who are going to come up with the successor to graphene and who they are. So I think if you're going to have an innovation economy, I think being open to uh, having an open immigration policy is essential. But I also think how universities deal with their people is important. And you mentioned the alumni network at Oxford as an example. Now, if you were to look in any of you know, the databases on university output in terms of venture capital backed companies, Oxford is not in the top 50, and I don't think any UK university is. The Indian Institute of Technology is, um, a couple of universities in um, Israel are. And yet there are a lot of Oxford alumni who've left and are building great companies. You know, I was in um, the San Francisco and I came across someone from my college who's built a uh, real estate um, software platform and he's raised 160 million and the business is worth 500 million. But I don't know whether even Oxford University knows this person exists and what they could be doing. So I think there is a real need to make sure that where alumni are concerned and not just what is coming out of uh, research schools, that the networks are created that connect them to the ecosystem and having a community of inventors, a community of entrepreneurs, a community of managers. And I think once you get to a critical mass, the system will begin to um, feed on itself. And that's what you see in Boston. That's what you see in the Bay Area. It's no accident that in most of these um, league tables, Stanford is number one in uh, Berkeley's number two because they're in the same ecosystem. And I think to do that, you've got to be very deliberate and conscious about it. There was a time when people who went out to uh, sort of fund or start up a company were those who had sort of proverbially dropped out of university. But now, actually, there are the people who are doing their masters, their doctoral degrees, their postdoctoral degrees. So linking them with business talent and finding a way to do that across the university, I think it's going to be critical to exploiting the full potential of the talent that is available, not just in terms of skills formation that they got a degree, but for innovation and entrepreneurship. And in that context, the business school has a huge role to play as an enabler within the university, as a partner with all the different schools, and to be able to catalyze and bring folk together these communities to drive forward a vision around all of this. But to do it, you don't need to, I mean, there's one way to look at it and say, well, we're 20 years behind Stanford. It's gonna be take a long time. I think Oxford has got distinct assets and by building on Oxford strengths, um, the business school focuses on a lot of sustainability, for example, Oxford can have a distinct brand and positioning um, in uh, this place. So it's capital and then it's people. And I'd say the final thing is it's being open being open to the world, being open to ideas. And whilst this undoubtedly happens in the world of research and it's critical to the world of research, I think in the world of innovation and entrepreneurship, that has got to be uh, the same as well. And when I look at the way a small country like Israel has managed to position itself as a startup nation of the world, it's down to great foreign direct investment, a great pipeline of talent but also being very open uh, to the ideas that are out there. And I think these three, if we embrace these three things, then you're, you know, we wouldn't just be talking about your nanopores on their own, or you mentioned Vasitech, we'll be, we'll be listing dozens of them in a few years to come. Thank you. Sam, those were very wise words. I mean, Sam's basically saying we need to create more unicorns. We need to access more patient capital. We need to make better use of our alumni networks. And also we need to create industry networks and make use of those as well. So Wendy, can I hand over to yourself now to sort of to give us your perspective? I mean, you've worked in many industries. You sit on the boards of many industries, et cetera. Uh, what's your advice? What should we be doing more of? 
Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, thanks, Chaz. And, and I really agreed with a lot of what Sam said. Um, I'm kind of here as the business person today, so I will I will speak to you a little bit with that with that view. You know, an early mentor of mine um, in business said, "You never shrink your way to greatness." So really, business is all about growth and all about ideas. And the um, emphasis on that, particularly in technology right now, has has never been greater. Uh, I'm fortunate to work on two boards where we work incredibly closely with different technology um, or with different universities in developing some of our technology. At Sony, we spend hundreds of millions of pounds every year on research um, working across universities worldwide, such as Berkeley, Stanford, many across Europe. Um, and at Logitech, which is a company I chair um, we actually, one of our headquarters is on the campus of EPFL. So I have incredibly close collaborations, anything from the InnoSwiss uh, investment funds, master's projects, um, do a number of joint seminars. Um, and we have a lot of, a lot of people transfers as well as sort of formal technology transfer, particularly doing work in miniaturization and, and uh, connectivity. When I step back from that vantage point and, and think about universities and businesses and opportunities, there's really you know, three areas I'd say uh, business looks to universities for. Um, in universities in particular, um, right now this war for talent has never been greater. And really the war for talent right now has shifted up completely a level to be thinking and looking much more rigorously for diverse talent. And that's diverse talent in every, every shape and form. You know, Sam talked about uh, visas and bringing in uh, different types of people, but that is what fuels really fast growing industries. So going out, identifying that talent and then nurturing them is central to economic value creation for business. Um, you know, I've, I've, for a long time, we've seen that with students, increasingly seeing that with professors. I was I lamented a bit seeing in the latest state of the AI industry report, the hoovering up of AI professors um, out of universities. And I think that's a problem because we've seen that when our most talented professors and academics leave universities, the number of startups and business ideas coming out of universities go away. So, you know, one thing business would really look for is how do we keep the, the best professors doing what they do best and get a diverse uh, student body? I'd say that the second thing that we look to, to universities for in terms of increasing value is really this idea of nurturing, governing, um, and inspiring and motivating researchers and their ideas due to elements that I think are really unique um, in the university world and hard to replicate uh, elsewhere. You know, first is obviously the, uh, the collision and the uh, germination of different disciplines and, and um, different vantage points, which really at scale, business could never replicate. Um, you know, I think you see that right now with the Oxford response to COVID. Um, just the breadth of, of the institution across divisions as the uh, VC laid out yesterday in her oration, that are working on this crisis, that 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 collision um, of ideas is really something that the business can't do, um, and I think it's even hard to do out, outside of that. I mean, the crick is an example, as as Sam brought up, but there's only so many cricks one can create. Um, the second piece uh, that I think universities do to help researchers, is there's a governance program actually in, in universities. Somebody's pointed out to me that the, the governance program of higher education is much more established than the governance of businesses. Um, having business governance, uh, having only been around for 100, 200 years versus some of our oldest institutions, you know, we've, we've developed honed ways through tenure and otherwise to pick people who had the biggest ideas and bet behind them and, and take some of that risk off the table for them. And that's another tremendous advantage in thinking about how do you best um, take ideas that there might be some passion for um, and growing those. I thought about, I, I watched a number of the innovation talks and seeing the talk on the Sicilian uh, inscriptions. You know, it's, it's taking ideas like that that really can, can magnify that uh, university governance supports. Then I think obviously the, the third thing um, in terms of nurturing researchers and, um, is this idea of patient capital. 
that Sam brought up. It's the idea of the economics of a university allowing ideas to look over a much longer time frame, rather than in business, sort of the um, you know the, the the quarterly or the annual uh, you know gun to our head that we all all feel in, in churning things out. And I saw that that you know that ability to do something where maybe you didn't see the immediate return with Andrew Pollard's terrific presentation um, about you know his work and the teams on the the typhoid the typhoid vaccination. And you saw that come that come to life. Um, the third thing that universities have, I think, really uniquely ways to add value, and I'd, I'd encourage uh, con continuing this in terms of the world of innovation, has to do with um, the global nature of the communities that are built around um, univer universities and uh, researchers. Um, you know, the Night Star presentation talked about the fact that, you know, companies don't share broad data sets. They certainly don't share them globally. I think this idea of peer review that happens more broadly, the idea of sharing data sets that certainly goes outside of the institution, you know, it's again, it's another way of having collisions that are increasingly becoming difficult for businesses to do, um, that there is a more structured way um, that I think um, universities can do. Regulators can help a little with those, with those collisions and that interrogation through laws, but those are awfully blunt. And the only other real interrogator, you know, will be consumers and markets, which sometimes are not as sophisticated as need be. Businesses, on the other hand, really can focus on developing, um, you know, taking these ideas and figuring out how one packages and commercializes those. You know, again, you know, the Nightstar team talked about the rapid geographic expansion that their partnership um, and, and, and with, you know, business people can do. Business also can focus on taking really large bets at pace. So they will have different um, different risk mechanisms and profiles to think about. They have access to capital to help universities to really amplify and, and magnify. You know, in technology, for every idea that's well considered, well thought out, that we'll take into our company, you know, we will need to spend 10 to 20 million or 10 to 20 times the amount of capital to get that idea out there and to make that big. So so it's a really complementary set of risk management and ideation uh, ideas. I also think from a business perspective, the businesses are, are not good with small ideas. So again, if you look for a unique niche or something that, that universities can do, businesses will tend to, when you have new ideas that are really big ideas that you're incubating, will overwater them, they will um, overmanage them, or the worst of all, they'll give them to the the most random talent who may not know how to nurture them. Universities over business, I think, can make a big difference there. Um, obviously, the, the challenge, um, you know, we're all facing a very complicated sets of challenges right now in the world. Um, from a business perspective, if we just for a minute, you know, step outside of COVID and step outside of, of Brexit and other challenges, you know, the world is getting much, much more competitive. We're having to turn out ideas at a much faster um, basis. I think universities will be well placed to be a you know a broader outsourcer of, of that very critical business issue, if you will. Pace of innovation is getting faster um, and rules are changing. And for, for business, it's becoming increasingly difficult to work cross border on a lot of big ideas, leading to global companies. You know, I, I feel that more and more being involved with Oxford, I think there's a real advantage to that. So there's a few things I would um, suggest that universities should be thinking about or doing to think about how do they increase that economic value. Uh, the first one is, you know, ensuring access to increasingly uh, diverse student group and ensuring that they are well trained up and ready to, you know, take on innovation more broadly in the world, whether they stay in the university. Um, secondly is, um, creating mechanisms to work cross border. Three would be figuring out how really to drive ecosystems, which are so fundamental. Um, fourth is figuring out how do we drive up the, um, uh, not only startup companies, but sort of mid companies out of our businesses. And then lastly is just ensuring we continue to focus on big ideas, looking out to the future and really things um, that are gonna matter for our world.
Andy, lots of wise words there. Diverse talent, retaining entrepreneurs and innovators, uh, creating collisions. I never thought of your comments about sort of university governance. You know, that's been going on for a long time, etc. And then also the comment about industry is not good with small ideas, which eventually become big ideas. Maybe we can come back to that. Wendy, that was superb. Tony, over to yourself, and maybe if you could compress your comments because we want to leave time for questions. Of course, thank you very much, Chas. We appreciate being here. Um, so, like everyone, I think UKI's vision is absolutely to ensure the UK maintains its world-leading position in research and and innovation. And as we've heard, uh, UK universities do well with commercialization, but we all need to work to do better. So just thinking about uh, compressing my comments, I think I'll, I'll go straight to I think the things that I think that we all need to work together in partnership to improve in terms of innovation and commercialization. So, so we're committed as UKRI to try and increase the scale and breadth of support for innovation and commercialization. Um, and the D in terms of the R&D um, landscape. But what we need to do, of course, is we need to work with universities to increase, I guess, the, the culture for innovation and commercialization across a wider range of disciplines. Um, so yes, we get a lot of into engineering and medical research, but we also need to increase the commercialization and innovation in the other disciplines. We also, as we've heard, need to work to um, increase the diversity uh, of the people that are involved in innovation and commercialization. So, and what I mean by diversity, I mean complete broad diversity. So social backgrounds, disciplines, obviously the obvious like gender and protected characteristics, but thinking about the wide range of diversity. We also need, of course, to make it easy for uh, university employees to do commercialization. And, and we heard about governance a minute ago from Wendy, but I think we all need to work to make sure that we reduce bureaucracy and make it as easy as possible. I think we also need to think about other elements of people as well. So we talked about diversity, but of course, skills is, is key. But as is um, uh, touched on by Sam and Wendy, the sort of mobility and porosity of university researchers into industry and other sectors and then and back again. Uh, we know that the, perhaps the majority of PhDs won't work in academia. Most of those will work in other and have careers in other other areas. So we need to make sure that they understand that sort of relationship of universities and, and, and um, commercialization and innovation. Uh, I've already talked about the need to expand uh, the, the range of disciplines, and, and I think that's a really exciting area. That's many universities, like Oxford again, is already playing a great role looking at the development of social sciences and commercialization. But I think, again, we need to do more about broadening that range of discipline. And then my final point, I think, is understanding the role of commercialization in the place agenda and the leveling up agenda. Um, absolutely, I think that the universities do well, but we absolutely see, I think, lots of opportunities for universities across the UK to increase their focus on innovation and commercialization. And, and we very much support, as you know, regional groupings of universities coming together to, to maximise access to VC and angel capital, for example, and, and develop funds. So, so I'll pause there um, uh, and happy to answer any questions or pick up any points. Tony, thank you so much. And again, similar comments around diversity, skills, but mobility and also this levelling up agenda. So Trevor, last but not least, so give us a few yeah. wise words, Trevor. Thanks, thanks, Charles. It's great to be here. And one of the problems with going last is, of course, uh, when you've got th three very wise people already making comments, there's, there's fewer holes. But um, one of the things clearly I think that we can learn from is, is how the university sector more broadly has responded magnificently in the last few few months to the to the needs not just of the broader economy and society, but of our our specific communities. Um, and reflecting on what actually lay behind that, I think is is useful you know what what can we learn in order to help us position ourselves to really set up systems that will help us through the next stage through the the post-covid economic re recovery um and of course the first thing to to say especially coming after after tony is that um 
these responses didn't just pop out of thin air, um, as we've already heard uh, from you, Chaz. You know, your research group didn't just suddenly think in January and February that it might be a good idea to understand something about developing vaccines. Um, the knowledge, skills and expertise that's been applied in the last few months is the result of underpinning academic research base that has been developed over, over many, many years. So, so lesson number one absolutely has to be around the criticality of maintaining that strong research base across our universities. Um, again, as we've heard, I think we've also learned a lot about how to very quickly turn that knowledge into practical application, uh, importantly in multi-partner collaborations across academic, public sector and private sector organisations. Um, so we do have a bit of housekeeping to do, and, and I must mention the, the Concordat for the Advancement of Knowledge Exchange in Higher Education that was published in May with a process around it that will be launched at the end of this month. Um, and that has been designed uh, over the last two or three years to make sure that as universities we do put exchange of knowledge with other organisations at the heart of our mission. Um, and that we do put the key elements in place to make this happen. And, and that includes making some of those, those governance uh, issues actually um, run smoothly. So making sure our policies and procedures are up to the job, um, making sure that we do support and reward uh, both staff and students who en engage in high quality knowledge exchange. Um, that also we have deep collaborations and relationships in place and that we have an ongoing mechanism for getting feedback on what we do and listening to that and, and improving what we do. Um, so if we do get that right, then we'll be even better than we are now at creating value. Um, and importantly, we'll do that in a way that is seen and recognised by our internal staff and students and, and external communities. Um, my final point is, is around the halo effect. I think that this does have on the area around us. Obviously, Oxford is a very international facing university, great international presence. But the impact you have on the city and the broader region is, is enormous. And, and I suspect that some of that you actually probably take for granted. Um, but another part of today's exam question was around the levelling up agenda that has already been mentioned. So how can we create innovation ecosystems uh, in other parts of the country so that we maximise the benefit right across the country and, and this isn't easy um, but you can imagine that as a vice chancellor of a university in North Staffordshire where private sector R&D is, is fairly limited um, there is a and there is a desperate need for innovation within existing companies and the inward movement of more innovative companies more broadly then this is something that's very much on our, on our minds up here. Um, we've created a series of what we've called Keel Deals around the economy, health, culture and social inclusion to help facilitate that. And I, and I mentioned that more in, in the realms of sort of pointing out the diversity of those areas, the economy, health, culture and, and social in, inclusion, because I think it's important that they go together. But we're a small university and, and post-COVID we all need to move more, more quickly. So what can we learn in other parts of the country about what you're, you're doing in, in Oxford and other, other parts of the southeast? Um, well, interestingly, Keel was actually formed in in 1949 by a former vice chancellor of Oxford uh, and a master of Balliol College, Lord Lindsay. Um, and he believed in the value of higher education and creating opportunities and, and to do that um, within underprivileged parts of the country. So um, I'm finding it an interesting thought experiment to think about what would be the equivalent now for, for innovation. And, and I'm honestly, again, not sure what the answer is, but what we can ask is about what the role of universities can be in that levelling up and why in creating those ecosystems we, we have an important role. And I think there's four, four things. Um, the first is that multidisciplinary research is core. Uh, the report I chaired a few years ago for HEFSI on technology transfer acknowledged that our impact is not just about technology transfer and commercialisation. All disciplines in the university have a, have a role and different universities do different things based on their portfolio and the environment they're, they're in. But it's also because we're a size that makes us a critical anchor organisation in our own right. And this is crucial in order to develop the relationships and indeed the influence that we have in an area. As we heard from Wendy, we combine our research with education so that we de develop the workforces with the ambitious and outward looking mindsets that are critical, but sadly too often missing. And this in turn develops the aspiration in the communities in which we are, are placed, which again, um, is, is one of the challenges that we have outside the southeast. And finally, of course, we can be an attractant 
for other organizations to surround us in order to amplify our impact, create the halo effect that I mentioned earlier, create an ecosystem that enables new innovation and the adoption of existing innovations as a matter of daily activity, rather than being an obscure sport that happens somewhere else. And, and just one example of that, a, a company that has been here on, on our campus um, for the last seven, eight, nine years, actually is one of the companies that is part of the manufacturing network that is producing the vaccine through AstraZeneca that, that you've, you've produced. Finally, I think what we've learned in the last few months is that all of these things are intertwined. And certainly in university, at university level, we, we don't have to see these as alternatives to other, the academic versus the innovation and the application. Um, but on the other hand, we do have to recognize that not every member of our staff can do everything at the same time. Um, importantly, the activities we're talking about today do not need to undermine that quest, quest for excellence in everything we do. And we certainly shouldn't resent the request from our funders to engage with this agenda as part of a system that supports research and education um, that really does have an impact way beyond the realms of academia. As I said at the beginning, the response of the university sector has been fantastic over the last few months. Now we need to make sure that we learn from this so that we can be more um, deliberate in our approach to innovation so that really we can put things in place to help over the next few years, which are clearly going to be very difficult for all of us. Thanks, Trevor, guys. thank you so much. So some great comments around sustained investment allows you to sort of exploit opportunities like the sort of pandemic, if that's the right phrase. Uh, knowledge exchange is an important thing between universities with industry, patient groups, regulators, etc. And then multidisciplinary, again, a plea for that. Now, there's been, I've been inundated with questions, many of them sort of slight tweaks around some of the comments that have already been made. Let me try and ask some sort of provocative questions and pull those out. Do you think in the UK we are ambitious enough that we think of moonshots? Um, you know, my sense is certainly that in, in the US there's certainly a lot more risk capital and they do make major investments in very large multi-institutional projects focused on very big goals. Um, do you think we need to get better at that or any thoughts? Anybody? Sam, Trevor, Tony, Wendy, you're all smiling at me, but sort of... Charles, I think it's interesting because there's, there's two different levels of that, really. Well, three levels, probably. There's, there's the individual, there's, there's the organization, in our case, the university, and then, then there's, there's government. And I, I think you've used the, the key word, which is risk. I think as, we're, as, a, as a nation, individuals, we're, we've got less of a, a risk appetite. As, as universities, we, we probably exist in a, in a system um, which, at its core, to make a slight political point, is, is fundamentally non-sustainable with the current financial arrangements that, that we have within our universities and some things, and therefore that depresses the, the risk appetite. Um, and then more broadly at, at government, I think it's gonna be interesting to see what happens over the next few years as we develop our, our new place in the world in terms of the relationship with different countries to see whether that has an impact on, on the view that we take uh, in this sort of area. Fantastic, you'll be pleased to hear that Roy Sandbach is listening to every word you're saying. Trevor, so um, lots of questions from him. So let me ask you another provocative one, and that, Sam, were you going to say something? Yes, yeah, so just to sort of build, build on what Trevor said. Um, I mean, if you look back to the Industrial Revolution, whether it was gaslighting or canned food, I mean, those were actually invented by the French. They were put into practice by the British. So we do have a history of putting great ideas into practice. I would say that when it comes to our research ambition, it is clearly very high, and the evidence is our, for that is our research rankings. I think translating uh, these ideas into businesses requires a certain risk appetite uh, over a long period of time, but more, more importantly, an understanding of failure. And I think with risk comes the likelihood of failure, but till you've got to that point and you're willing to do that at scale, 
it's quite hard to get the winners, which is what um, some other countries are, do very well. I mean, we do it in our own way, but I think we need more risk, a bigger risk appetite and understanding that you know, things don't always go right if you're trying something for the first time, which is what happens in the lab. We need to understand it in the commercial world too. So let me ask another maybe slightly provocative question, and that is that, again, my sense is that in the US, there's more of a culture of moving across these different stakeholders in the ecosystem. So in Boston, the area I know well, you know, you'll get an academic coming out of Harvard, they'll go off and set up a biotech, and then they'll go back to MIT, and then they'll go and work in Novartis or something like that. <laughs> and I sense in the UK, we're doing that, but maybe not to the same sort of scale. Is that a fair comment, Tony, Wendy, do you think, or is that unfair? So, yeah, I mean, I think it is a very fair comment. I think it's something that we need to think about um, as the UK in terms of how do we uh, allow that, facilitate that and reward that two-way, you know, porosity. Um, you know, there are a number of schemes such as, you know, innovation fellows and that, those sort of things, which I think help. But you're absolutely right, there is an underpinning um, thing that we need to grapple with, you know, in terms of how do we support university research is going to industry, industry people are going to universities and actually reward that. Um, and so absolutely, I think that's something that's a fair comment that's something we need to think about how do we how do we sort of tackle that? You know, yeah. I, I think in some part this this uh, feeds into this idea of ecosystem a lot more. Um, I actually grew up in the Bay Area. Um, and one of the things that's always amazed me about the UK is how much more networked the UK is as a country, because geographically, it's a lot easier to be networked here than it is in the US. But I've been surprised as I've gotten closer to Oxford and other um, higher education institutions that, it, that, that the barriers there feel much stronger. And one of the things that strong ecosystems allow, and it sounds like, um, you know, Trevor is, is creating that um, in the north, but it is this idea of different money, different entrepreneurs, different businesses that are socializing, that are working together, that make it much easier to kind of go in and out. And I think when you socialize and when you do that, it's also a lot easier to accept failure, which I think was the, you know, Sam's point too, because you start to see people in a, in a broader way. So you have a network of people to support that. Um, so I, I think lots of opportunity to do better there. Many Joseph, of sort of what, one of the interesting conversations we've had over the last few years uh, with Research England and, and HEFSI looking at MIT, Stanford, in terms of what universities should be doing to and support staff around in, uh, innovation, um, was very much a feeling coming from over, the, over in, in Boston, San Francisco, that actually universities need to do less because that ecosystem is, is there. So, well, uh, to some extent, what they need to do is just allow the staff to disappear for a year, but guarantee them a job back at the end of it if things do fail. And if they don't, if they go well, then obviously they'll 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 fly fly the nest. And um, there aren't many parts of the UK, if any, that have that level of, of infrastructure and ecosystem around them. Can I also? I mean, we all worry about people, and you know, we worry about it in the university. Wendy says that you know the war for talent in industry, et cetera. And it's people who make great things happen. And, you know, I think, Wendy, it was you who commented about retaining some of these professors, you know, and frankly, here in Oxford over the past few years, I've seen some of our senior academics who have become entrepreneurs, they've created companies, they've gone off and become CEOs. Fortunately, they're staying local and they've created hundreds of jobs there. And personally, more recently, I, three of my senior colleagues have left and they've gone off to work in industry. Now, I think that's a success story. Um, you know, we're getting more of this sort of movement around. But of course, it does make challenges for us because when a good person leaves, they inevitably leave a hole and it takes the time to recruit somebody and train them up, etc. So what do we do more to, if you like, retain these professors, retain entrepreneurs? You know, many of us have often thought about some of our most innovative 
entrepreneurial young kids, they whiz off to the US and then they never come back. So how do we retain more of those individuals? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll take a stab at it. And um, people, other people can, I, I think the nature of the contractual arrangements and the flexibility in there is important, which I think is what has been alluded to, to allow for a more sort of porous border between the world of industry or innovation and academia. And, but I also think one thing really to look at is if, is the slice of the cake that you get if you do come up with a well-beaten idea and really thinking about how that could be aligned to incentivize people to stay and follow through ideas and build, see them through into big companies. I think that equity aspect of it and how you can get a bit of equity surely um, has a role to play in being able to retain people Keep, and, and also incentivize them to pursue what I call the spirit of adventure in the commercial aspect, what a university does. So I think some of you commented it's taken MIT, Stanford, maybe two, three decades to get where they are, you know, Boston and Stanford. I hope it's not going to take us two, three decades to get there. I mean, sort of, if there were, I'm going to, if there's one comment if there was one thing that each of you would recommend we do, what would it be? So maybe just in sort of half a dozen words, if you could just to finish this off, uh, maybe Sam, let's start with yourself. What would we do? Give us one bit of advice. We want to be like Boston in three years' time. What do we do? It's people. people. Oxford is great because it attracts great undergraduates. It does great research because it's got great people. And also do, do well in innovation because it's got great people with great ideas who can manage and grow these businesses. So becoming a magnet for people with ideas that they want to turn into reality is the single biggest thing that I would advise you to do. Well, I mean, you know, this is the first time ever I'm going to disagree with you, Sam. I mean, Oxford's been attracting great people for 800 years, but we haven't created a Boston here. So what have we done wrong? So. Well, it's, it's the people who are incentivized to grow businesses. That's, okay. the, that's what's ah, different. Okay, okay. Okay, incentivize our people to create companies. Wendy? Having been at Stanford and the Bay Area 25 years ago or so, um, you know, the key thing that happened there, one of the key things that happened there really was the Internet. And the Internet took off, and you had an ecosystem, back to that horrible word, of people come capture that and figure out in your area of specialism, how do you really drive excellence? We may be at one of those moments right now, not with the internet, but certainly with some of the biotech breakthrough or potentially with some of the AI stuff. So I would say pick a big idea and develop an ecosystem. Fantastic, Wendy, thank you. Tony. Yeah, so I mean, I agree. I think I think it's, it's absolutely. I think what we need to do is is develop the the culture and the support mechanisms around the whether it's early career researchers, PhDs, professors, to to absolutely develop, commercialise, and innovate up to the point that they're happy to. Um, so I don't think it's a one size fits all. So I think we need to provide that sort of system of support around researchers to either start to be in our companies or not stay in academia, but develop and commercialize. Trevor? Um, I'm a big fan of universities working together better and, and almost defining the geography. I mean, the, the, the Bay Area <laughs> is actually the size of England north of Manchester, including Manchester, um, and likewise the Southeast. So you might not be able to do it in Oxford, but actually combine Oxford, Cambridge and, and London, as long as you get that transport link working between Oxford and Cambridge, that I know you want desperately, then, then actually defining that geography and, and we can do it with better working together. Well, there's lots of suggestions there. And, um, you know, let me just leave you with these comments. I mean, I, all of us working in this Wendy ecosystem, um, we are very privileged. You know, we're surrounded by smart people. 
we work in nice environments, we have wonderful jobs, we enjoy all the people we work with, etc. And increasingly, society, industry, and government is looking to people like us to create solutions to these big problems. And, you know, I would say, if in five years' time, we have not changed this ecosystem, then we have failed. And um, so let me leave you with that. Thank you all for listening. Thank you in particular to Sam, Wendy, Tony, and Trevor for all your wise words. I think this conversation could have carried on for another couple of hours, but I'm sorry we've run out of time. But thank you, and thank you for also for sending in the questions. Please reach out to our panelists and continue the discussion. And thank you once again. Thank you. All the best.